our church, we study the Bible verse by verse. We study in what is called an expository way. And so this morning, we want to make sure that you're ready to study with us. We've been studying a wonderful book of the Bible, the book of Philippians, a book that is written by someone who's in trouble, and he's writing to people who are in trouble, and he's seeking to encourage them. And this morning, we come to something called a blessed paradox. The Bible, in all of its wisdom from God's truth, uh, presents to us some things that on the surface they seem confusing and they even seem to contradict one another. But as we study and as we learn about the intricacies of what God has designed, we start to see that our first take is often mistaken. How many of you have gone and looked at something for the first time and you go, oh, that's not right? And then you learn more about it and you come to see oh, there was a bunch that I didn't know. And you come to see that, oh, that's very right. It's very correct. Well, we have that in this, in this morning, and I always love it when we study passages of Scripture that at first they, they may not make any sense to us, or they may seem to be confusing and be in conflict with other areas. And then when we dive into what they really mean and what it's really saying, it fits perfectly together like a lock and key. And let me just say to you that that is the nature of the Scripture. The Scripture fits together like lock and key. There is no part that does not match the other. And uh, God's Word is trustable in every way, and this morning we will see this. Now, we have been studying Philippians chapter 2. We just sang about the Ancient of Days because last Sunday we did look at the fact that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He is Lord over all things. And so I want you to notice here, and this morning you will need your Bible open because we're going to pass through a couple of pages um, in Philippians and look at a couple of areas. So um, if you haven't already, many of you... Um, Unless this messes up some other part of your regular reading, I would encourage you, if your Bible has a ribbon in it, to put it in Philippians so each Sunday it's very easy to get back to our central passage. Um, that might help you with that. Um, and as we look, we will be progressing on as we look at this blessed paradox. Well, let's look at the background and um, the, uh, uh, the context of this. If you're new to us this morning, this will help you understand a little bit about where we've been. Paul is dealing, in chapter 2, he's dealing with the issue of unity or disunity. So fill that in on your outline. He's, he's recognizing that the Philippian church has a little bit of a problem. Now, they are a loving church. They are a church that in general is doing the right thing. They've done the right thing. He knows them well. He loves them well. But he's writing to them from afar because he's heard in part that there's some issues that they're dealing with, not only persecution, but they're also dealing with some unity issues. How many of us have known about churches that deal with unity issues? We, we recognize that. But notice here with me in the text where we started off a couple of weeks ago. This is squarely, this is not our text from this morning, but look at the screen in front of you. This is what we studied a few weeks ago, and this sets up the context of dealing with unity and then even where we were last week in the Lordship of Christ. Look at verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ and any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, key part here, setting up for the next, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. You see, that'll solve a lot of problems in your home. That'll solve a lot of problems in your church. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but read it out loud. What does it say at the end of verse 4? but also to the interests of others. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not to ever look after your own interests. Sometimes we have to do that. I mean, you have to eat, you have to work, you have to have shelter, you have to take care of your children and so forth. I mean, those things are important. There are key things that you do need to look out for within your own life. But if that's all that you do, you're missing out on the mind of God. Because the mind of God is a mind that looks to others. God's love, listen, God's love is an other-oriented love. It's not a self 
love. It's an other-oriented love. And so we, we see number two here. Not only is he dealing with unity and disunity, but he talks about, Paul has just reminded the Philippians of the model that they have in Christ Jesus. So this is our next section in chapter 2, and we've spent a couple of weeks on this. Notice what it says, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This is the down part of the J curve. You remember we talked about the J curve. If you want to go up, you got to go down first. And this is what we see God do in setting the example for us. Look in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in who? Christ Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, that's in the form of God in heaven, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. Verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He became a man. That's Christmas. That's that's the incarnation. That's when we celebrate his coming to the earth. So he's born in the likeness of men. And verse 8, and being found in human form, here he lives his life and he humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, amazingly, even death on a cross. So this is the idea of a public curse, a total rejection. Now, my friends, this is the picture of Christ's humiliation. This is the down part of the curve. This is the example of Christ lowering himself. But then we go on. He doesn't stay in the grave. He doesn't stay dead. But because God sees his humiliation. Look what God does in chapter 2, verses 9 and through 11. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is what? Above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, look what it says, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What a glorious picture. What a glorious image. This is Christ's exaltation. So his humiliation gives way to his exaltation. The Father sees the Son's obedience and exalts him from the lowest place of having become the sin of the world and taking it to to death, to the grave, and he rises him up, raises him up to be the Lord of all things. Now, I want us to also notice here that this is, and notice the progression here, God the Son was in heaven with God the Father. That's the first part of what we just looked at. And then we see that he humbled himself and he became a man. And then we see, after you fill that in, he humbled himself and became a man. He was obedient to the point of death on a cross. This is the part of his obedience. Now, this is very instructive for us today. You just wrote the word, he, is, he was obedient to the point of death on the cross. Would you circle that word obedient? Because that's going to play into the rest of what we study this morning. And because of that obedient, even unto death on the cross, therefore the Father has highly exalted him as what? Lord of all. And so in this, we see the glorious picture of God coming in showing us what his love looks like and showing us what all he has in store. Number three for you to fill in is that in light, and this is a, this is a, a big sentence, and I want you to get it, and I, I think I've, I've pretty much left it where there's no blanks. Um, maybe there's just one blank, but I want you to get this. In light of Christ's humiliation and exaltation, which we've just read, The Philippians are to live out God's salvation of them by living in unity with one another through the example and power of Christ. So look at that again. Notice what it's saying. Because we see what Jesus did, that instructs how we are to live our lives. And if we're saved, in the beginning of this chapter, he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any fruit of the Spirit, if there's anything about you that is saved, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united. I mean, this is the picture he's saying, if you're really Christians, then act like it. So if you really have God's salvation, then it should play out in your lives. Now, 
There are some churches that are so plagued with disunity and so plagued with powerful selfishness that they never reflect Christ. And that one would even wonder in some churches if anyone is saved. Now, I do think it's possible that a church can be plagued with unity problems, and there are believers there who are trusting in Christ ultimately for their salvation, but yet they've just been deceived and they're walking in the flesh and not walking in the Spirit. That is possible. But when you see, listen, when you see overriding systemic sin either in, in your own life or in the body of a church, we need to wonder if we have valid faith. Because what we're going to see in this passage is that God's salvation brings about a change in our behavior. And we are called to live in a manner that is worthy unto God. I want you to see this next passage, and this is our passage of study this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12, it, it just leaves that section that says that Christ is exalted to the glory of the Father, and that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. So now he says in verse 12, therefore, in light of the fact that you have this model in Christ, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Who's writing this? Paul. He's saying, look, when I was with you, you would obey, but now that I'm not with you, I want you to obey. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, verse 12 in verse 13, present to us a paradox. Verse 12 and verse 13 makes us go, blah, blah, blah. what was that? We, can, we just, okay, wait a minute. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying for us to do something here that, that we work, but look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we're, we're tempted to say, okay, well, which one is it? Is it our work or is it his work? How does this work? I mean, we, 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 can, we can begin to be a little bit confused here, and there's, there's a bit of a paradox, and that's what we want to see. Look at number four. Here we see the great paradox of God's salvation and our response to it. There's many Christians that have never been walked through this before. So I, I, I pray that this is um, incredibly helpful to you this morning. This may take you to a new level in your walk with God. And I, and I, and I pray that it does. Look, that, that we, we are called to look at this paradox of God's salvation and our response to it. Look, what is a paradox? First of all, a paradox is a seemingly absurd contradiction to logic. So it seems to be a contradiction. That is actually what? True. So it seems to be at odds, two things or multiple things that seem to be at odds with one another when you think about it in truth and in logic. But once you start to peel back and understand what is actually there, we come to see that even though we may not fully understand it, we learn it to be true. We come to learn of it. Now, there are several biblical paradoxes, and I pray that these help you this morning. I pray that you don't get stuck thinking about any one of these, because these are awesome, and these could make you, in some ways, um, become very interested in them, um, and maybe even a distraction. I pray that that won't happen, but I, I do want you to focus on this one, but I want you to see what we mean here. First of all, there's the paradox of the nature of the Godhead. What do we mean by the Godhead? We mean the Trinity. We're talking about God. When we talk about the Godhead, we're, we're talking about Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, how can God be one yet in three distinct persons? That seems to be a paradox. That seems to be an antinomy. But we learned that it's, it's actually not. It, it works in perfect harmony. And so, 
This is the antimony, antinomy or the paradox of the Godhead. What about this one? The nature of Jesus. The nature of Jesus. Was he God or was he man? What's the answer to that? Yes. He was truly God and he was truly man. He was both of those without, without any disagreement. What about the next one? The nature of Scripture, what you hold in your lap, the, well, the book that you hold in your hand. We would say, is this the Word of God or was this written by men, by humans? And the answer to that is yes. yes. You see, God working in, in the power of His might with all of His, with all of his ability, God brings together the words of men to be his words. Now, I'm not one who believes that, that with strict dictation. I believe that God perfectly inspired his word working through the mind and the heart of Moses and of Jeremiah and of Isaiah and of David and all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through those of the New Testament, 40 different authors, 40 different writers over a 1,500-year period, God is perfectly revealing himself in his written word because his word is just that important. And then he preserves it for us. And when you go back and you do textual criticism analysis and you go back and do all of the manuscript analysis of how we got the Bible that we have today. In fact, Marcy and I used to live in North Africa where the Bible is what we call canonized where over a, over a 150 year period, the, the councils of the church were meeting together under the leadership, I believe, of the Holy Spirit to determine what should be properly recognized as the letters of the Word of God, and what is not? What are the things that very clearly show this is distinctly from God versus the things that are not? And I believe the Holy Spirit led that process to a very reliable uh, position where we can see this indeed is the Word of God. And I, it's a beautiful thing. Do we accept part of that by faith? Absolutely. But is there a lot of evidence to back it up? Oh, yeah. I love to study that. I love to teach on that. I love to share about that. We have tons of materials in our bookstore about that. But is the Bible God's word or man's words? The answer is yes. God worked through the hearts and lives and minds and personalities of men to bring about his inerrant, infallible, reliable, authoritative word for us. Notice the next one there. The scope of our salvation we see in the Bible that this is offered to the whole world, yet applied only to the elect. That is very, very clear in the words of Jesus, in the words of Paul, and it's hinted to throughout the Old Testament that God has a people and that he calls the whole world to himself. He desires that none would be lost and that all would be saved. And we see that this salvation is applied to his elect. And this is part of the great glory of his grace. Remember with me that God doesn't have to save anyone, and it's amazing that he would save even one. But instead of saving just one, he saves people from every tribe, every people, every tribe, every nation, and every generation. This is an amazingly gracious God that would save a sinful people. Notice the last one, and this is the one we studied this morning. It's the nature of salvation, the work of God and the response of man. That's part of what we see here in this verse is that we start to see, again, the unfolding of the fact that this is God bringing us to salvation and then calling us not only to believe to Him in conversion, but also to obey Him in our sanctification. You see, salvation is always and only the work of God. I, I want you to just recognize that it is God who saves us and we do not save ourselves. Fill that in. Salvation is always and only the work of God. Look at Psalm 3, verse 8. Salvation belongs to who? The Lord. The Lord. That's where salvation comes from. And then look at the next one there. In Psalm 37 and verse 39, it says, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. And then look at Isaiah 43, verse 11. This is on the screen. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior but who? Me. But me. 
over and over. We, we could do this all afternoon seeing that God is the God of salvation and that there is salvation in no other. Acts 4.12 says that there is no other name under heaven or earth, on earth by which men must be saved. In John 6.44, Jesus makes it very clear that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is pointing to the nature of God's salvation is only salvation, excuse me, our salvation is only from God's salvation in all things. You see, it is God who saves his people, but interestingly enough, they must respond in faith. Do you see that there on your outline? This is a beautiful picture that was reclaimed in the Reformation. Three of the five solas are listed here. Salvation is by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. You see, salvation is by God's grace. We just talked about that in starting point. The fact that God would have undeserved favor. Starting point, folks, what how, did we deserve, how did we describe that? We described that with the judge who unzips his robe, takes it off, and goes out and pays the price of a man's sin. This is the God who pays a price that's not his sin, but the sin of his people. He goes and he, the perfect sacrifice, lays down his life. He gives undeserved favor, grace alone, through faith alone, brought out there to the side, faith alone, our response. This is our responsibility. We are called to faith, have faith and believe. And even in God's grace, he gives us to faith and believe, but we are called to believe. This is our responsibility. This is what we do. And what do we trust in? We don't trust in ourselves. We find his grace through faith in Christ alone and only in Christ. You see, this next passage, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 um, and then also verse 10 is very critical to our whole study this morning. Um, for folks who've been around uh, church life for a long time and maybe even learned to share their faith, um, sometimes we read this passage and we put it on autopilot. Don't do that right now. I'd like to encourage you to read as if you've never read it before and see how it fits with Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Because it's, it's very similar, but just in a reverse order. Look what it says here. In verse 8, it says, Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Through faith. Faith in who? That's in Christ, right? So, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. He's, he's making sure you understand it. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as, as a result of works so that no one may boast. Now look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now it is a tremendous deficiency when Christians only think about my relationship with God in relation to my salvation from my sin and my hope of heaven alone. That is not the whole of the gospel. Listen to this. The whole of the gospel is, is that God has saved you in this life for good works for his glory. God has saved you so that you will glorify him, listen, by the way you live in faith during this life. And so it makes no sense that you would say, well, I've been saved and by his grace, I can kind of slack off and do what I want. Now, that would indicate that someone truly doesn't understand the gospel because this verse, in verse 10, it goes on to say why you were saved. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. You see, we just got finished over in starting point talking about religion versus relationship and that good works can't save you. And it's completely true that good works can't save you even though you have been saved for good works. And so this is a, a beautiful picture. Now, Satan loves to confuse things. 
He loves to confuse things. He loves to throw people off the trail of the gospel. And so what he, will, what he loves to do is to convince you, oh, no, 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 it's by your good works that you're saved. It's not, it's not by Christ. You, you, have to, you have to do these things, and then, and then by your good works, you earn God's approval, and this is completely antithetical to the true gospel. If you would, put out there to the side of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, just a little note. Um, next to verses 8 and 9, over on the right-hand side, I would say, put out there the words, his work. And then below that, out to the side of verse 10, just below that, put out, put these words, our work. You see, we see his work, and that leads to our work. And our work is completely wrapped up in his work. So look at it again, Romans 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. That's his work. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. We, we've been made by him, created by him, and saved by him. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God gets all the credit because he's even prepared all of our good works beforehand that, look what it says and underline it, that we should walk in them. Now, this is, this is key to understanding the true gospel of Christ. You see, notice the next statement that is here. In seeking to understand the relationship of our works and God's salvation, the following statement has been helpful to many people. And many of you have said this as we've studied the Reformation and the five solas of the Reformation. We made this statement and many people said, oh, I think I'm getting it. Look what it says. Faith alone saves. But faith that saves is what? It's never alone. What is this saying? It's only by faith in Jesus that you can be saved. It's not by your works. It's not by any goodness in you. Because aside from Christ, there is no goodness in you. But when we see this, that faith alone saves, our faith that saves is never alone. If someone is truly a Christian, their faith is going to be accompanied with works. And that's what we studied when we studied the book of James. We said faith without works is what? It's dead. It's not real faith. If you say, I have faith, you are called to show it by your works. Not to gain it by your works, but to show it by your works. Notice the next statement here. This may be helpful to you as well. While good works will never contribute to your salvation. It doesn't even contribute. While good works will never contribute to your salvation, they will always point to your salvation. You see, good works that are done with the, with the right heart, and that's what makes it a good work, is that, that God comes and changes our heart and allows us to do the works that he has prepared beforehand. Good works that are done from the right heart simply reveal that we're saved. Look at the next part. But be aware that confusing the two may reveal an absence of salvation. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, is that if you are confusing the works that you do and why you do them, it may indicate, listen to this, that you don't understand the true gospel, that it's only through Christ that we can be saved. This is a key thing. I know you're flipping your page, and that's okay, I guess, but, but I, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. Because when we start to think that our works contribute to our salvation, well, you know, God must be really happy with me. And I guess when, you know, finally I breathe my last and everything, I'm going to be thinking about all the things that I've done. Oh, well, I gave that money to the church. Certainly that did something. I mean, maybe, and, you know, I, I did all of this in the nursery, and I did this, and I did that, and I was good to my parents, and I, you know, all of these things certainly got, no, friends, that is revealing that your faith is in yourself and not in Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring, but only to the cross I cling. That is the gospel. Nothing in my hand will I bring to God. 
in myself. The only thing I bring to God in myself are the works that he gave me to do, that he prepared beforehand, and that he saved me to do. And so my entry to heaven is not at all contributed by my salvation. It is only in Christ. And anything that I do upon this earth simply points to the picture of God's glorious salvation. I pray that that is not confusing to you. I pray that you're starting to see, and perhaps some of you even today are coming to the place of conversion to Christ and walking away from your own self-reliance and coming to a Christ-reliance because that is indeed how we are converted in this life, from a life that is in darkness to a life in his beloved son. Now flip your page over and notice here. I want us to just quickly run through 12 and 13, and we're gonna, ask, we're gonna answer this question, question, how do I live like a Christian? How do I live like a Christian? How do I really do it? How do I work out my Christianity? How do I live like a Christian? And this is assuming that you are a Christian. So I, this stuff don't work if you don't know Christ. Um, that, that has to happen first. But if you truly have come to know Jesus, if you know that you know that you know that you have transferred your trust from self or anything else to Christ, and he has converted you into, into his family, friends, this is how we walk with him. I want to first read the passage ahead, and then we're going to break it down. Look at verse 12 at the top. In fact, I'd like all of you to read verse 12 with me. Let's read verse 12. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep going. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Number one, if you want to live like a Christian, number one, you must remember Christ. You must remember Christ. And that is what the therefore is pointing to. Do you remember the verses that came before this? Let me just tell you, the verse, and if you're looking in your Bible, that's why I wanted your Bible to be open. In verse 11, that ends with saying that he has been declared Lord to the glory of the Father. So it's his humiliation and his exaltation. And what comes after that is the Apostle Paul is saying, therefore, because Christ was humiliated and because Christ was exalted, to the Father. Therefore, my beloved brethren, brethren, as you have always obeyed, now also uh, in my presence and also in my absence. So, notice this, that, that you must remember Christ. When we see Christ's humiliation as Savior, because that's what saves us, is his humiliation as Savior, and exaltation as Lord, that's part of our salvation, it's through the resurrection of his dead, indeed we do that. But why did the Father raise him from the dead? Because of his willing, obedient humiliation, his payment for our sin. He took the wrath of God for us. This is Christ's humiliation as Savior and the exaltation as Lord. This is what we remember. This is what Jesus did. Look at the next part. We live remembering his sacrifice for our salvation and his power for our sanctification. So you're not trying to live out the Christian life thinking about yourself. Listen, this will set you free. Don't try to live the Christian life thinking about yourself. Seek to live the Christian life remembering what Christ did. That's how you overcome pornography. That's how you overcome your anger. That's how you overcome your apathy. That's how you overcome the things in your life that are keeping you from right relationship with God and right relationship with others. You remember Christ. The war that you have going on in your flesh, you just start looking to Christ, remembering what Christ did, remembering that he went to the cross for your sins. He died for the sins that you're struggling with. You can't continue to remember Christ and his sacrifice for your sins and go on sinning. If you can, it means that you're not saved. He who practices sin, this is the way of his life. This is what's ruling over his life, ignoring the Savior. The Scripture indicates that we cannot know God. So, oh, I know. We need to really get back to thinking about who is ruling my life, who is reigning over my life. And the only hope through that and out of that is to keep our eyes on Jesus. 
And it's amazing that when you start to get your eyes off the world and off of yourself, how the battle with sin changes. Because you can't look to Christ and worship Christ and be in sin. He's going to root it out. He's going to winnow it out. He's going to come and work it out in you. And this is what we see happening even in this verse. So we must remember Christ. That's why the therefore is there. It points back to the verses before. Notice the next part. Number two, you must remember Christ's love. I love this part of verse 12. Look what it says. Therefore, circle those words, my beloved. Now, this, is, this isn't talking about Paul loving them. This is talking about the fact that he's saying, you guys are my friends that are loved by Jesus. And this really helps me in my struggle to obey the Lord, is that he truly loves me. It's not just about what he did, but he pours out his love on me. My beloved, you see, those who are in Christ are loved by the Savior. They're loved by the Father. So if you belong to God, it's because he loves you, and there's no other reason for it. He has an unconditional, unswerving, unfickle love. So the the glorious remembrance that we are loved by him helps us to work out our obedience, our salvation in Christ. Look at number three. You must understand, if you want to act upon your faith, you must understand the priority of obedience. It's not merely a priority of faith in Jesus. But that faith in Jesus is accompanied, listen, it's accompanied with a priority to obey him. Now, there's a whole bunch of verses that I've listed here, but notice this. Obedience is a very big deal to God. We learn and we obey. Do you remember what the Great Commission says in Matthew 28? He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. And so you are called to go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So already there's the command to go, there's the command to be baptized, that anyone who comes to faith in Jesus, they are to be baptized. And then it says this, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And so there's this, there's this body of knowledge that God wants us to have. Now, he, he's given us his word so we know what he taught. And the picture is we're taught these things so that we would do them. James talked about the man who um, hears the word and then goes away and doesn't do it. It's like the man who looks at himself in the mirror and he's forgot what kind of man he is. A lot of James talks about the importance of putting your faith to action. And the picture is, is that if we are in Christ, we are called to a life of obedience. Now, a good job, or excuse me, a good task for each one of you this afternoon would be to go to Luke 6, 46, John 14, and John 15, and Matthew 7, and Ephesians 2, and 2 Corinthians 5. Those passages help you see that Jesus is saying, don't call me Lord if you're not going to do the things that I say. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? And his word will be, depart from me, I never knew you. Because indeed, they did not truly do what he had said. Over and over again, Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who love me are those who do the things that I say. So we need, to, we need to carefully see that obedience is part of the plan. Now, you know, there's a lot of people that want to go to a church that just talks about the salvation of God, salvation of God, salvation of God, and lets them live however the hell they want to. And I mean that. However hell's options are is that they want to live. Friends, that is not the way of Christ. The way of Christians is the way of heaven, not hell. We don't focus on everything that's going to hell. We focus on everything that's going to heaven. That is what is to be the passion in the obedience of our life. And so we build up treasures that are in heaven, not on earth where moth and rust collect, but the things that that cannot be corrupted. 
This is how a young man is to order his mind. This is how a young woman is to order her mind as she's growing up, to take on the values of Christ, not the values of the world. This is what it means to have a priority of obedience. Does that make sense? Youth, are you awake over here? Oh, gosh. Youth, are you awake over here? Okay, good. Number four, thank you. You must accept the responsibility of obedience. So not just understand the priority of obedience, but you need to accept the responsibility of obedience. And we see this in verse 12. Look what it says in verse 12, just below the line on number four. It says, in verse 12, it says, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So Paul is saying, hey, Philippians, y'all need to obey even if I'm not there. It's kind of like when mom and dad leave and they say, okay, kids, we're going out on a date and we expect you guys to do the right thing, you know, and you're sitting there going, okay, they're going out. Are we, you know, we don't have the accountability right now. What are we going to do? Now, it's not just about kids. I mean, I, it's, it's about all of us. And here it was for the Philippian church. The accountability was important that Paul was talking about, that they would obey. See, notice this, fill it in. The way we can apply this to our lives is don't wait on or look to others to make you obey. Take responsibility for yourself. Now, this does not mean that you don't need Christian accountability. In fact, if you want to take responsibility for yourself, you still need brothers and sisters around you helping you walk with Christ. There's many Christians that never make it. They never obey God because they do not have relationships that are talking about Scripture, that are praying together, that are holding one, account- one another accountable and seeking to spur one another on to love and good deeds. That's what we're called to do. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but gather together for fellowship and encourage one another to do the right thing together. I heard yesterday about a, gr- a community group that is going to an unbeliever's home, and they're going, that somebody who's had a really, really hard time, a group of our, of our people are going to someone who's had a hard time here, very close, very locally, and they're going to, they, they, there's been some issues in their family, some real hardships, and this team of people is going to go help clean up their apartment, their water heater has been broke, and they have children, they have no hot water, so this team has bought a hot, a hot water heater, and they're going to install it, and they're going to clean and really help this family try to get back reestablished. And I mean, they, they do not know God. They do not love God. And our team is going to go do that. Now, here's part of the picture. That team here from Sheridan Hills is saying, hey, let's go shine the light of Christ in love to one of our friends. And let's do this together so that they can see. You see, it's one thing if they think one person's going to do this. But when they see two or three or four or five or six who think the way that they think and do what they do, they start to sit up and go, who are you people? Why do you do this? How do you know each other? And this begins to show Christ. So this is the responsibility of obedience. We need that fellowship. We need that accountability in those things. But you can't just depend upon everybody else to do it for you. Now, just notice here, beware of the helpless victimization movement in our society today. This is a massive problem in America and the world. Everybody has a reason for their ungodliness or for their weakness or for their frailty and all of these things. And, and there's, there's just a constant mentality of the victim. And I just want to encourage you, in Christ, you take all of the hardships and the injustices and the weaknesses that we have, and we turn it to Christ, and we seek to be strong in Him. That doesn't mean that the lame just get up and walk out of their wheelchair. That's not the way that works. But it starts to say that I'm living not irresponsibly, but I am living to be responsible for what God has called me to do in obeying Him. Number five, and this is the, really the crux of the passage. This is the key uh, verb of the passage. You must obey God as his child. You must obey God as his child. This is talking about our salvation. When we talk about this is the fact that he has saved you for a purpose. 
Philippians 2 is written to saved people. We see that definitely in verse 1 of chapter 2. This is in the context of people who are saved. So look with me here in verse 12. It says, work out your own salvation. It does not say work for your salvation. There are some through Christian history for the last 2,000 years have twisted this understanding and falsely preached that this is some way gaining your salvation. Work for your salvation. Work toward your salvation. Absolutely not. Only Christ can save you. Philippians 3 makes that very clear. Paul wouldn't contradict himself in his own letter. But notice here with me that this, that this verb, katergazomai, is the call for the energy and the power to finish a task. You know, it's very appropriate the way we use that term in, in English language today. I'm going to go work out, right? Um, Pastor Lucas loves to do CrossFit, I and mean, that's why, you know, he's, he's just super strong and super able and all that. I mean, and a bunch of other people love to do that with him. And they go move tires and climb stairs and swing from trees and do all kinds of things. You know, I don't know if you see sneaker marks on the buildings, it's because they're climbing the buildings. So, so whatever. They, they work out. They work out all the time. They, Pastor Andrew, you want to go work out? Huh? Y'all have it. Uh, that's good. I've already got my own injuries. Not, not doing that anymore. But but the picture is, is that this is, this is putting forth our effort. You see, God saves you. Fill this in. God saves you, but it's your responsibility to act on his salvation. You cannot save yourself, but God's called you to act. He converts you to a position of righteousness, so he calls you to practice that righteousness. When you're saved, you're made righteous in him. But then he calls you to act on that. Look at the next part. At the moment of salvation, you are justified. That means you're made right before God forever. It's amazing. But the rest of your life, you are being sanctified. That means you're getting your practice in line with your position. You're getting your, your behavior in line with your sonship with Christ. Number six, if you want to live like a Christian, you must recognize the consequences of sin and self-deception. You must recognize the consequences of sin and self-deception. Now, look with me back up at verse 12. Look what it says. Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but also much more in my absence, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Well, the only thing that really ought to cause us to be concerned as followers of Jesus is the idea that we can sin, is the idea that we would dishonor God is the idea that the Savior who died for us, that we would dishonor him, that we would bring shame to him. That is what should cause us to fear and have trembling. That is the picture that we are called. Notice this. There are consequences to sin for believers. We can grieve the Lord. What does that mean? That means that we, we bring shame upon the Lord and we, we do not do what he is calling us to do, that we would grieve the Holy Spirit, that we rob him of his glory. Now, in one way, God can never be robbed of his glory. You, you're not going to make a dent on his glory, except that we, are, we do see that when we do not give him the glory that is due to him, that this is part of our sin. And when we do this, we are missing out greatly. In fact, we are, fill this in, we are forfeiting his blessings and his rewards. You ought to be afraid of that. You ought to be afraid of missing out on God's blessings in this regard. That should cause you to tremble, that, that you would be unfaithful to the one who has given you so very much of himself, even unto death. And this also leads to being chastised by the Lord. All of these are due to sin. Now, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom the Lord loves, he spanks. He corrects them. He helps work the sin out of them. But you know, it would be better if the sin is not there, if obedience is what characterizes our lives. And so we see this call 
to obeying him. Number seven, it's God who gives you the power to obey. We see this in verse 13. Look at verse 13. In fact, read verse 13 out loud together with me. What does it say? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That was incredibly weak, but we're going to keep going. So notice this, that it's God who does this. Now, we'll circle back on this because there's so much there, but look at Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, this living for Christ is we look to Jesus, we depend upon Jesus, we determine to obey him in his power, in his strength, and we recognize that if I'm going to trust him, if I'm going to obey him, it's because he has ordained this for me. We don't stand passively, idly by. With a degree of piety, we pursue the Lord. With a degree of discipline and action, as it says here, we pursue the Lord. We pursue action. We work it out. We seek to obey. But we recognize that it is God who gives us the power. I love, just right out there to the side, 1 Peter 4, 11. I want to encourage you to go look at that one up. And it simply, it, it beautifully captures that the one who speaks, let him preach exactly the words of God. And the one who serves, let him serve with the, with the power that God supplies. You see, God supplies you power. Number eight, it's God who transforms your mind. It's him who changes. Look what it does. In verse 13, it says, for it is God who works in you. And then look what it says, both to will, that's changing your mind, and to work for his good pleasure. God comes and does stuff that you can't do. He does heavy lifting and changing your heart. He comes and he, and he works as you obey. He is working and he's moving. He does what you cannot do. He transforms your mind. He changes your will. He changes the way you think. Look at Psalm 119 verse 36. God, incline my heart to your word. That God would come and he would change my mind to his word. Look at Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's, that's what he does. He, he transforms the renewing of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. God does this in us. He renews our minds. He sets us apart for his glory. I mean, don't miss verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work. And what is all this for? for his good pleasure. Here is, I love this, the way this ends. You see verse nine, or number nine, it's for God's glory and his good pleasure that he works in you. For his good pleasure, you can rejoice in the Father's love and that he delights in his obedient child. And he empowers you and changes your mind and your heart as you look to Christ. We need to be very careful to be a church that obeys God. You need to be very careful to be a Christian that says, oh God, I want to work out my salvation. You've saved me. Now may I work this out for your glory. Amen? Amen. Would you stand together as we pray?